Interviews gone wrong have always been a great source of entertainment. Whether it's bands showing up intoxicated, situations turning awkward, or even interviewers that intentionally annoy their guests. Like when a news anchor brought up the feud between Motley Crue and Poison during an interview with Nikki Six. Who rocked harder in the 80s, Motley Crue or Poison? What a asshole. And who could forget the incredibly cringy moment where Gene Simmons fell out with his wife on live TV? Please come back here. Please come back. Shout and come back. And speaking of Gene Simmons, back in 1979, trouble was brewing within his band Kiss. The group was experiencing declining ticket and album sales, while internal conflicts brewed among the band members. The tension came to a head during a fateful appearance on the talk show Tomorrow, hosted by Tom Snyder, where guitarist Ace Fraley showed up drunk. But you're kind of like a spaceman, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> On the side. Uh, hey, you know, listen, I got a little piece of pipe backstage I'd like to have you work on. <laughs> Tell me about it. Gene Simmons only became more and more furious with Ace as the interview went on, and you could clearly see it in his face. Half the equipment, oh, I see there's a live human being over there. Half the equipment. Stealing space bear in captivity. I got him, he's captured. <laughs> Captain Bear. Okay. Space Bear. <laughs> How are you, Tom? I'm all right, thank you. In, in your own <laughs> This moment marked a significant turning point for Kiss, who by now had divided into two factions, Gene and Paul versus Ace and Peter. The tension palpable during this interview provided a foreshadowing of what was to come, and by 1982, both Chris and Fraley were out of the band. Don't okay. do it. I'm not doing anything! <laughs> Paul Stanley would later recall this interview, stating, It may seem funny that someone's drunk, but the fact is, the root of it was, I believe, contempt and lack of respect for the audience and the fans. Now, despite Stanley's feelings on the matter, this next musician consistently appears intoxicated in front of his beloved fans. Of course, we're referring to the Prince of Darkness himself, Ozzy Osbourne. Throughout his decades-long career, Osbourne has been involved in numerous interviews where his altered state of mind renders him unable to articulate coherent sentences. In this rare gem, even his guitarist Zach Wilde was utterly zonked, leading to a hilarious dynamic. As Ozzy struggles to make sense of things, Zach's own composure slowly crumbles, making for a one-of-a-kind interview you just have to see to believe. I mean, it's all to do with his drugs and alcohol rehabilitation. I think someone's still taking drugs and alcohol somewhere. There's even a moment where they refer to their plane as both a bus and a boat, resulting in a burst of laughter. Not on this bus? No, not on this boat. No, this is... This is uh, clean, man. I'm clean for once. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Have you guys... Uh... <laughs> When the interviewer then amusingly brings up the topic of toilet paper, Ozzy jokes that he even brought his own toilet on tour. Now, of course, the question before we get into the next video is, did both of you, I don't know if Zach's still with us or not, did, did both of you bring your own toilet paper? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and our own toilet. It's safe to say there was nothing like MTV in the 80s. And while some interviews with intoxicated rock stars can be highly entertaining, there are other times where they can be downright embarrassing, and frankly, hard to watch. One such interview occurred in 2005, when Creed frontman Scott Stapp made an appearance on Spike TV's Casino Cinema to promote his solo album. However, it soon became apparent that Stapp was heavily under the influence, which is all the more disheartening when one takes into account that Creed had just broken up due to Scott Stapp's ongoing struggle with substance addiction. Thanks for so, joining us here. Yeah. You know, Beth, how are you, man? Yeah, see it? We yeah. met. We, we kissed. <laughs> So. You know, like, the deal was, man, is it was like, you know, I, I felt like people needed to, you know, like, know what was up. The woman whose back of the head and neck he grabbed happened to be Howard Stern's wife, while the host was an actor from The Sopranos. Neither of them were spared from Stapp's exasperating behavior, causing frustration for everyone involved. Uh, Dave Grohl got a little, <laughs> little, <laughs> got a little Hey, Dave Grohl from the Google Hey, Dolls. Dave Grohl, you got a little You know, my son thinks babies come from my sack. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> I just have to continue on with that theme that, son, my babies do come from my sack. Stapp would then begin to scream incoherent ramblings as the host attempted to urge the audience to remain tuned in for the upcoming program. Ah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
to register yourself online. Yeah, yeah, so I'm back talking the next about kickboxer right here on Spike TV. These days, Stapp has thankfully achieved sobriety, with this television appearance serving as a reminder of the destructive power alcohol once exerted over his life. God has called me no, no, no. to say the things about the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Like, he called me to bring the plate of God into the house of the Lord. You're gonna have me saying? drinking. This is unbelievable. That's what God called me to say. That's that the Great Divide. The, the guy divide, sold brother. 50 million CDs. 50, 50 million. million. Thanks for stopping by, man. However, sometimes an artist being interviewed is stone cold sober, only to have their conversation interrupted by a drunken peer. That's exactly what happened when Kurt Loder attempted to interview Madonna after the 1995 MTV Video Music Awards. The conversation swiftly unraveled as a result of Courtney Love, who, under the influence of alcohol, started throwing things at Madonna, who responded by stating, Courtney Love is in, in dire need of attention. Right now. Loader told Love to join them, but Love's drunken state prevented any meaningful conversation, leaving Madonna cringing in the background. Love accused Madonna of previous rudeness, which she believed justified her interruption. However, Madonna strongly disagreed. Well, she's been mean to me that day. So. I haven't been mean to anybody. Ever. Ever in me my neither. life. Me neither. I never been mean to person. I never punched anybody at all. Really? I never said anything bad I about I never anybody. clocked a soul. Love then awkwardly bowed before Madonna, which made her visibly uneasy. She silently signaled to her team that she was done, leaving Loder to handle the situation on his own. Occasionally, though, it's the interviewer who's had too much to drink, much like in the next interview we'll discuss, which even led to the interviewer being fired. In December of 1976, an unexpected turn of events unfolded when Queen was set to make an appearance on Bill Grundy's Today Show. Unfortunately, lead singer Freddie Mercury fell ill with a toothache, and the band had to cancel. In a frantic bid to salvage the situation, the band's record company proposed an alternative act, the Sex Pistols. Little did anyone know, this interview would soon become infamous for all the wrong reasons. From the very start, everyone involved would admit they were less than sober, with the situation only getting worse from there. You see, they are as drunk as I am. They are clean by comparison. They're a group called the Sex Pistols, and I'm surrounded now by all of them. Just let us see the Sex Pistols in action. Grundy persistently attempted to provoke the band by teasing them about the amount of money they received in their record deal. The band grew frustrated rather swiftly, which led to lead singer Johnny Rotten uttering an expletive during the live broadcast. I am told that that group have received £40,000 from a record company doesn't that seem uh, to be slightly opposed to their anti-materialistic view of life? Uh, more to marry Really? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me more about it. You fucking spent it. It's what? Nothing. A rude word. Next question. No, no. What was the rude word? Shit. Grundy then proceeded to behave inappropriately towards certain women in the entourage, crossing the line into creepy territory. Are you? Yeah. Uh, that's what I thought you were doing. Yeah. Always wanted to meet you. Did you really? Yeah. We'll meet afterwards, shall we? <laughs> you dirty son. <laughs> you dirty old man. The studio staff made urgent efforts to cut away and bring the segment to a close as quickly as possible, while Grundy appeared visibly overwhelmed and unsure how to handle the situation. Although the Sex Pistols achieved their desired publicity, Grundy faced consequences. He was suspended for two weeks, and subsequently, his show was cancelled. Well, that's it for tonight. I'll be seeing you soon. I hope I'm not seeing you again. From me, though, good night. And while the Sex Pistols undoubtedly caused trouble for their host, it was nothing compared to how Iggy Pop completely derailed this interview in 1979. Now, from the moment the singer appeared on the show Countdown alongside the legendary Australian journalist Ian Meldrum, it was clear something was not quite right. One album. Hiya, dog face. <laughs> Iggy, how are you, mate? Listen, well, good night, good night. Well, the interview was not only chaotic, but it was also evident that Iggy Pop was disengaged, with Meldrum struggling to maintain his attention. Live in concert? What's wrong? You don't you say that? <laughs> you behave yourself. Now listen, we've got to ask you some sensible questions. All the right. first time was a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago. Hi. Uh, was with uh, Iggy. Will you concentrate on the questions? Ah, uh, with David Bowie. Um, yeah. He's had a lot of influence on you, I gather. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what, can you answer these questions properly? Pop has since stated that he was not under the influence at the time. Rather, he had a severe case of jet lag, coupled with a sense of betrayal from his record label, all leading to this disaster of an interview. This next clip shows a musician being disengaged for an entirely different reason, as at Lollapalooza 1994, Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins had the task of interviewing Australian musician Nick Cave. However, Cave was far from pleased with Corgan's approach of asking generic questions from a sheet of paper. Nick, how did you get involved with Lollapalooza? Um, well, my manager rang uh, me up and told me that I was going to do this. I, I've done this same interview with, uh, are these your questions? <laughs> these are not my questions, Nick. Right. I take no credit for them. All right, here, I'll ask you. The same questions. I've already done this with MTV. All right, here, I'll ask you a, a different question. Corgan attempted to lighten the atmosphere with a joke, suggesting that all countries outside of the United States are essentially the same. Unfortunately, the Aussie singer was not impressed. Yeah, well, A, we're not English. I apologize. Australian, I'm sorry. To all us Americans, it's, you know, it all looks like one country. Yeah, well, it's not. It's not. I know. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. The conversation never managed to recover, and ultimately ended with Cave criticizing Corgan for his immaturity. How old are you? 27. You're not, you're not a teenager. I know, I'm not a teenager. No, I'm saying the mentality. You have the mentality of a teenager. Absolutely. Cave certainly did not hold back during his interview. However, this next band would take things one step further, opting to straight up torment their interviewer. In 2003, English rock band Blur would mercilessly haze Canadian journalist Nardwar, who is known for his eccentric interviewing style and quirky persona. While many artists eagerly await the chance to partake in a unique conversation with him, Blur couldn't care less, as drummer David Rontree would aggressively snatch Nardwar's hat and glasses, tossing them around as he attempted to ask his questions. John, would it be okay to stand over there? <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> Stand there and ask your question. Okay. It's gonna be fine. Okay, I'll just okay. We're all gonna be fine. Additionally, frontman David Albarn's lack of enthusiasm and growing frustration only exacerbated the situation. Who are you? My name's Damon Albarn. Who are you? I am Nardward a human serviette. Damon, who do you have why? with you? Why why do you call yourself a Who else do you have in the group with you right here? Who is the gentleman that just took my hat? That's a nice smile. All right, Dozy Bollocks, how you doing? Nardwar endured continued bullying, and even when the band eventually chose to respond to some of his questions, their answers were filled with meaningless nonsense. Who are you? You know who I am. You're Alex. That's right. So Alex of Blur, who invented fish and chips? Who invented poo? Blur would later issue a public apology, with their drummer attributing his unsavory behavior to his ongoing struggles with drug addiction. You happy? <laughs> no, I'm not. You don't look happy. I am not. I want my hat back, please. <laughs> okay, there we go. On the other hand, this next clip showcases a host who was determined to be the bully, leading to one of the most infamous interviews we've witnessed thus far. In 1997, during an interview with the Gibb brothers of the iconic Bee Gees, British talk show host Clive Anderson crossed the line with his relentless insults. Despite reportedly being a fan, Anderson's behavior contradicted this as he continuously mocked the group while they were simply trying to promote their new album. And uh, you've been some highs and lows. Well, mostly oh, yes. highs in your case, <laughs> but... Uh, More highs than you yeah, imagine. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, what was that? That Because uh, that, that's perhaps the most distinctive thing now, that, mm. that high-pitched... Oh, the That's it, yeah. yes. Yeah. Were you working with Mickey Mouse at the time? <laughs> <laughs> the brothers barely had a chance to speak amidst Anderson's incessant snark, and their frustration only grew as the conversation dragged on. Pretty happy together for most of the time, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I think it's because we all have the same sense of humor. We just yeah. have fun. Because yeah. I didn't realize you were real brothers. I I think your sisters, actually, yes. but... but uh, <laughs> Barry Gibb reflected on the experience, describing it as, quote, just a barrage of inferred insults. And then in the last sort of, uh, before we became the Bee Gees, we were Latossers. Yes. Which we thought was... Yeah. Um, um, You'll always be Latossers to me, but I don't know. <laughs> After a painful nine minutes, the Bee Gees stormed off stage, clearly fed up. And honestly, who could blame them? It turns out that this interview was a last-minute addition to the show, and Anderson, in hindsight, deeply regretted his ill-conceived attempts at humor. In 2020, he candidly admitted to The Spectator that he had made the grave mistake of underestimating the Bee Gees' lack of amusement towards his jokes.
jokes. And while Anderson managed to offend all three of the Bee Gees, in this next interview, the Beatles managed to offend an entire religion. It all began in 1966, when the legendary group was being interviewed by the London Evening Standard. At one point, John Lennon remarked, We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. The quote gained attention months later when it was featured on the cover of Datebook magazine, leading to a massive backlash. There were protests in the American South, destruction of Beatles records and merchandise, and worst of all, death threats. In response, the band held a press conference where Lennon attempted to clarify the quote. He explained his words were not necessarily about the greatness of the Beatles, but rather a commentary on the state of organized religion. No, I'm not saying that we're better or greater or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person or God as a thing or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said and it was wrong, or was taken wrong, and now it's all this. Lennon regretted the outrage he had caused. Unlike this next musician, who showed absolutely no remorse when answering for his crimes. Following an April 1988 arrest for beating his wife with a lead pipe and firing a gun at a car she was in, rock and roll pioneer James Brown sat down for an interview on CNN with host Sonia Friedman. Well, I feel it's good. It sounds to me as though you're not troubled by any of this at all. This is a man's world! Thanks for reminding us of that. Every once in a while, we forget. During this phase of his life, it is widely speculated that Brown struggled with an addiction to PCP. This particular substance is notorious for inducing unpredictable behavior in its users, an accurate description of Brown's interview with CNN. And what are you going to say to your fans when they ask you some questions about it? I'm going to say, I feel good! Papa's got a brand new bag. It's a man's world. Well, that's the second time we've heard that in two days. That's very interesting. Now, don't leave us, James. You stay right there. I'm we have more that we have something. to talk about. Numerous reports suggested that Brown was under the influence during the interview, as he spontaneously broke into song on several occasions and even elaborated on his way with the ladies. Now, the women love you when you get out there. Why do you think that is? Because I look do you think good. That is? You I look smell good. good. I yes. feel good. And you sing good. And make love good. Oh. If you liked this video, then you'll definitely want to watch our video on rock star feuds that got physical. Click here now to learn all the shocking details about the legendary confrontations between some of your favorite musicians.